Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, at last afternoon of TAG, for everyone who grabs their train back home, or plane, if you're lucky enough. <laughs> so, I'm going to talk to you about statistics, about archaeologists, my bread and butter. That's what I love to do, study you guys. Uh, so, what do we know about students? I'm using two sources in this uh, discussion right here. One is from HISA, which is the Higher Education Statistical Agency. Most people are probably familiar with it. It's whenever you see something quoted about, you know, we have this many archaeology students, or this age, something like that. It usually comes from these people. Sort of not as well known is the university's statistical record, which predated HISA. It was the same body, they just changed the name, changed it around a little bit. Um, they started collecting statistics in the 1970s because they kind of realized that we knew almost nothing about the UK uh, universities. There was you know, some basic stuff, some counts of students, but they knew almost nothing. So they created an organization in the 19, well, late 1960s, early 1970s, and started collecting data. Um, that folded, but luckily they kept the data and put it online, so yay for open data. Um, so you can access this if you wanted to. Um, oh, it's, I've tried my best to try to put something together. There's a lot of problems with this data. Um, one is they've changed definitions throughout the last 40 years. Uh, forensics kills me. Um, they've combined archaeology, science, and forensics. And forensics has gotten incredibly popular in the last decade, adding thousands upon thousands of new students which makes archaeology look like we're adding thousands upon thousands of new students. Um, we're not. We're, we're pretty much level as it is. But there's all these sort of changes that happen throughout the data, and it's, it's a bit rough. Um, they changed. Uh, HISA only puts out reports, so paper reports between 1994 and 2002. So I can't actually access the data. It's not already been put into a table, which makes uh, pretty much limits to what I can do. Everything before 1994, Great database. I can query it. Everything after 2002, again, I can query it. Ask all sorts of great questions. There's sort of a black hole there where I'm stuck with whatever data they gave me. This is my first foray into what you can call big data. So I love this, de this definition of big data, which is big data is when you can no longer use an Excel. <laughs> <laughs> and so this is the first time I had to create a database, not because you know it's easier to query, but because I had to. There was no other choice. Um, the data from basically the 1970s, 1980s, too much to fit on an Excel sheet. So this is my first foray into big data, um, working with databases. Of course, I've done that before, but first time I've been forced to. All sorts of issues, uh, you know, lots of data, people entering all these forms, universities, you know. Thousands of forms you put into this database. Mistakes happen. Uh, this data, I'm pretty sure, is going to be fairly accurate, but just realize there's some um, little bits of errors that will creep into it. And they also tend to do some rounding. So for some reason, you'll, you'll notice this if there's numbers up there. It seems like archaeologists happen to travel in fives. We don't. They just round up or down to five. Um, just to sort of you know, make that a little more anonymous. So that's just the background. Uh, and this is some of the stuff that we know. So uh, this is currently, well, currently it was 2012, 2013. FNS stands for Forensics and Archaeological Science. Um, ARC is archaeology, which happens to be based in the humanities side. So this is sort of the breakup of how many students we have at the moment. This does not include um, continuing education or further education students. That's a whole different database. Uh, but we have about 6,500 students currently in archaeology. We have probably close to about 900 PhD students. Uh, there are possibly only around 600 uh, academic positions. So we now currently have more people taking PhDs than there are jobs. If, for example, everyone was at a conference and it wiped out all the academics in, uh, in the UK by a plane crash or something, we could fill that up instantly with all the PhD students we have. Uh, we also have over 1,000 master students, and that number keeps going up. And we have about 4,000 uh, undergraduates. This is sort of a distribution of what they look like at the different universities. So UCL is at the very end there. Um, and then some other smaller departments are at, the, at that way. But this is basically how many students you'd have 
at different departments in the UK. Most students are going to experience archaeology in a fairly large department. Most of them will be in a department that's about, probably about 200 plus archaeology students. Now, I should also say, this data is a bit, bit tricky in that they sometimes count people as halves. So if you were saying half archaeologist, half historian, or doing half you know, degree in history, you get counted as history and archaeology. So when I'm talking about 6,000 some archaeologists, there's some weird stuff where people are actually doing multiple different sort of uh, degrees, but how they divide it up, how they decide to divide it up, uh, sort of ends up with archaeology being lots of people and other places as well. So basically most people, at least two-thirds of all students, are going to be in a large department, probably over 200 other students somewhat interested in archaeology or taking archaeology classes. There's only a couple of people who end up in very small departments, and so most people will actually leave university with a fairly decent sized cohort of other students um, that they'll know from their university. A few will probably know every single person who's in that department because there's only 10 of them. But for the most part, most people will leave with a fairly large cohort. So this is, a, this is what I call my UKIP uh, slide. <laughs> <laughs> Archaeology tends to be fairly diverse. Um, we tend to enjoy people uh, and let, have them undertake degrees here in the UK from other countries, you know, bringing tens of thousands of pounds to the country, um, and so forth. This is basically from the 1970s. It's only postgraduates. Um, again, issues with data and all definitions and stuff. Um, it kind of dropped down a little bit in the 1990s and early 2000s. I think that has more to do with the changed definitions. And we're now back up to about 17% of all archaeology students <coughs> are basically non-UK students, non-UK nationals. So that includes EU and everyone who's not EU. And that number has about doubled in the last 10 years. So it really went down, but I suspect that actually has more to do with how they were defining and doing the data than an actual loss since the 1980s. These are how old the students are. Two thirds of students are going to be under 24. It is a relatively young, um, somewhat traditional, if you call it not, there's, not, there's a, quite a few non-traditional students in archaeology, but for the most part, archaeologists, or archaeology students, follow the sort of typical university path. That is, they go around 18 years of age, do an undergraduate, do a master's fairly quickly afterwards, possibly a PhD. They're still saying a third of, um, of archaeology students are at least 25 or older, so you are looking at some people who are coming into archaeology later, but the vast majority of students are actually quite young. And looking around the room, I think this seems about right. We are incredibly white. Um, and this is a pretty accurate reflection of the profession as a whole. The profession is about 98, 99% white. And some of these other ones are other and don't know. So I suspect that we're actually probably around 97% of students are white. Um, this excludes students who happen to come from a different country. This is all the UK. I don't know why they split up the statistics that way, but these are only UK students, or UK nationals. Um, EU students and people from other countries are excluded for this. Don't know why, but in terms, so that I think adds a little bit more diversity <coughs> to archaeology, um, which I hear next year's tag is going to be the theme is diversity. So, uh, it'll be very interesting to see how this turns out. I touched on this a little bit uh, earlier, but archaeology actually attracts a fairly high percentage of people with disabilities and students. Um, it doesn't attract as many when you get up to a PhD, very few. Um, specific learning difficulties is basically things like dyslexia. Um, and this is the first degree. And actually very, very high. So dyslexia is about 8.1%. The normal student at a UK university, it's about 1.5% have dyslexia. So Archaeology tracks a lot more students with uh, learning disabilities than other 
other fields. And that is sort of a trend with hands-on ones. So geology does attract a lot of people with dyslexia, agriculture as well. So we're kind of in that norm. But from the general, uh, you're about five times more likely to be dyslexic if you're an archaeology student than a normal. This I found very interesting. It was one of the ones where I could actually combine across all years and get all the data. Grade inflation. I don't know if students are getting smarter <laughs> or if grades are just going up, but they are definitely, definitely going up. Um, it's amazing. So 1977, I believe, two people got a first in all of the UK. Uh, I used to say, like, when students would come and ask me, you know, what do I put on my CV? I was like, wherever you do, do not put your grades on there. No one actually really cares. Everyone has a first. Well, I take that back. If you happen to have got your degree in 1977 and you got the first, you should be really proud. It was you and one other person. But for the most part, um, all the grades are going up. Um, first are going up. Second class is going up. And almost no one fails archaeology, or at least gets a third um, anymore. So it's grades are getting better, or at least students are getting, expecting to have better grades. Uh, so it's interesting to kind of see that, how if you were to talk to someone who got you know, the degree 20 or 30 years ago, your perception versus perception now. So um, this is some of the earlier data. Really interesting stuff is that the ratio pretty much evened out in the 1970s. Um, the top one is undergraduates, the bottom one is postgraduates, and it's how the data gets collected. It wasn't actually collected between before like 1974, but it capped some people before that. So it's not like suddenly the 1970s, all, all of a sudden gender equality happened. Um, that's just how the data was collected. But basically, you see that they're pretty much equal. We've had about the same amount of male and female students in archaeology since at least the 1970s. This is how it is now. Um, it's very interesting. So forensics and archaeological science, the term science in there, has more women than the humanities one. Um, there's always the sort of the interest that women tend to be uh, scared away from the sciences. In archaeology, that's the opposite. We find more women involved in archaeological science than we do in the humanities side. And that's last year's numbers. So it's now about 60-40. That is the profession. So it's gotten better. Uh, archaeology as a profession now is about the UK average. So about 47-48% women, which is about what the average is across the whole UK. Uh, there's a slightly lower participation rate in women in the workforce than there are men. But when we first started tracking these numbers, they were pretty poor, under 40% of women in 1997. And it always had been assumed that basically, well, you know, 70s and 80s, there's more male archaeologists than the students. They're more interested. Uh, it's just playing itself, itself out. That's not what the data shows. The data shows is we've had gender equality in students for four decades, and the profession hasn't actually caught up. We're still very behind. If the profession caught up, we'd expect to see 40, 60% women um, working in archaeology professionally. So we're still lagging behind for decades, quite a bit. Uh, and that's pretty much the findings I have. So if anyone has any questions, shoot away. Leave in the back. Um, so you probably made it clear at the beginning. I probably didn't. <laughs> <laughs> this was a poll that you gave. Yes. Is, is there any possibility that you can regionalize that data in just England, Scotland, and Wales? Yes, for except for the years between 1994 and 2002, until HISA decides to digitalize that data. I can't do that. So I can do anything after 2002 and everything before um, to regionalize it. And I can regionalize it 
as in where the people live, or regionalized by the universities they went. So there's that data as well. Do you have any data about external mural students? Because obviously, at some time in the past, that was quite a big uh, cohort who were doing archaeology, who may not have actually come out with archaeology degrees. Yeah, so there's, there's, there's further education uh, data sets. Again, <coughs> PISA, because they decided paper is the best way. Uh, between 1994 and 2002, that data is pretty poor. Um, I can look at the data in the database now, and there's a massive amount of information from the 1970s and 80s. And actually, 1970s and 80s, there was thousands of people taking archaeology courses who were not doing it as a major. Um, really interesting data sets to look at there. But yes, there's all sorts of stuff about non people not looking to get an archaeology degree or doing it as sort of a second you know, for fun in a career. So there's, there's that data set, yes. You would notice that age difference probably Yeah, um, they, they're very much older. So uh, for uh, there is so much data here. I could turn this into a book. Um, I just did a couple of snippets for this. Um, further education is a whole other thing. But yes, they tend further education um, almost flips the other way in terms of ages. So you see almost everyone up in their 50s and 60s um, and fewer at, at the bottom. Gabe. Um, this is the era of university league tables and rankings. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm sure you're aware, I thought I'd raise the rumor. Um, universities, it's in the interest of departments, not my department, obviously, to <laughs> find ways of manipulating, manipulating is a strong word, massaging uh, statistics um, in different ways to our knowledge, looking at things that like, like grade inflation. There are ways of, pre of preventing low grades happening. There are ways of doing all, all kinds of clever things with stats if you want to. So I just wondered um, whether that's whether you can see any changes when league tables start to, to come in and when league tables start to be taken very seriously. No, because that might be a time when um, changes start to appear that may not be real changes. No, you might be able to see it if I went down to like each university and looked at a department. Suddenly, all their grades went very high one year. Um, you can kind of look at this, and this is it's just a bit rough. Um, because of numbers and stuff like that, but the trends tend to be fairly level. Um, and it really, it does accelerate towards the beginning of the 1990s. But you can't say like, oh, 2002, that's when Times Higher Education put out their first whatever and then all the next year everything drops. Um, it, it's been a long-term trend and it's basically been going on since we've been keeping statistics on uh, UK higher education. Uh, Alice. Um, what are your last or later points on the, the gender bias, the higher levels, and the fact that it's not due to previous generations because the, the ratio was very equal? Do you think that, when you looked at that data, do you think that people are using the argument, oh, we just need to wait for people to come to the system and then things will get better? So that's why we are not having the leaky pipeline discussion as much as like STEM is having. I, I, well, that's what I was trying to get across is we've had this, we should, it should have been equal in the 1970s or 80s, and it hasn't been, and there is not. Unfortunately, it's the reason it's getting slightly better is just that there's so many more women doing uh, archaeology degrees than men, and that's slowly pushing up. Um, so it's not even gender equal there. So you actually have a really disproportionate, uh, I mean, it's 60-40, which is pretty extreme, and that's starting to push up professional. Um, I don't think that's the right way to do it, where you'd end up with, you know, 70% of uh, students are women, just so we can have 50% of professionals. Uh, I do think it's a very big issue we should be talking about. Uh, did you have a Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was um, thinking about, do you think that the trends in uh, grade inflation in archaeology in particular are uh, just a reflection of wider social trends in grade inflation yeah. from secondary school onwards? Yeah, archaeology, we're not very special. So um, we follow the, the different trends. So grade inflation goes with pretty much all other disciplines. Um, you see sort of jumps in numbers of students in like the late 70s and it falls in the 80s, all, that's not archaeology, that is all students at university. So we tend to follow um, basically the trends. Right now there's a, fewer, a couple of fewer students, we've sort of kind of leveled out just like everyone else. There's big growth in the 1990s, big growth with everyone. Um, we don't <coughs> tend to deviate uh, too much from the university sector as a whole, except when you get to women in the profession. But do you think that, that the the upward swing in grades has, a, is, is that reflected in sort of how people actually work in, say, the profession or? So it might have a knock-on effect. We have a lot more master students, so 1,200, um, and that's about doubled in the last decade. When you look at the profession, 48% uh, have either a PhD or a master's, and so 
with a higher, I mean, when you, you know, most, most universities require like a 2-2, two, 2-1 two, two, to get in. And now that almost every student has a 2-2, two, 2-1 two, two, to go, you know, to go on to a master's, it's a lot easier. You, you've expanded, we've, universities, whether they've consciously done this or not, have expanded their base of students who can go on to a master's. Um, they haven't, we're not really actually excluding too many people. Cause I don't think there's any department that requires a first to a master's or a PhD. I, I'm sure I'm, there's might be one or two, but I think even like Cambridge and Oxford just requires like a 2-1. So uh, we've slowly expanded the amount of students who can then go on from. Now, whether university is thinking, oh, we should up our grades so now we can get more master students because they tend to be a cash cow, depending on the department. Um, I don't know if that's been conscious. I don't think it is, but it is one of the sort of side effects. Uh, Kevin? On the, on, the, uh, on the gender balance, uh, I hesitate to use the word quality, but on the gender balance, I wonder if. Uh, the survey you did wearing another hat, the mm -hmm. profile of the profession, I mean, that actually shows that up until about the age, I think, of 39, actually in the profession, the ratio of, of, of male to female is about equal. However, after 39, I'm right, I'm right, suddenly for women, it drops. I mean, it doesn't just drop by a few percent, it drops to a very, very large percentage. And I wonder if that's reflected in the kind of overall look at the professional side of it, that it doesn't represent necessarily there is that big drop off of the age of 40. Yeah, so professional, we have to wait five years. Yeah. Um, it's been really interesting because we've been slowly seeing it being pushed up. So each each age cohort basically moves up and you're not really losing women. And so recently, 1990s or so, was the first time we actually had fairly decent age gender ratios and actually uh, when you're looking at younger professionally probably more women in the out of the 20s and 30s are archaeologists than men our concern is that it's going to hit what i guess you could call the baby ceiling and that possibly you know right around the 30s is when a lot of women have children and that might be hurting people's careers and that might cut i mean as we all know, professional archaeology, especially commercial sector, it's temporary work and it's job to job, and that's very hard to do when you have a kid. And you know, if you don't have a permanent job, you don't really get maternity leave, as it were, from your job because they just get laid off. So we're really interested to see in five years if we still see that generation bump up and keep going up, or if there is actually sort of some sort of level at the you know late 30s, 40s, where people decide families over archaeology. Um, so, yeah, that's something really looking forward to in three years when we do the next Profile of the Profession, see if that happens. I think we've got just time for one more question. So. I think Mark had was up. Uh, the European perspective on, on the opening up of the Masters. Uh, bachelor's degree uh, didn't exist on the European continent, and therefore everyone who had university uh, became a Masters. I had a, has a Masters. Translated, I have two Masters. Uh, there was no other option. I couldn't be a bachelor in the Dutch system. Due to Bologna, you see that universities are sort of creating this, this unified European tuition landscape, and therefore, you, in England, you should have had, and probably the universities realize that, in the whole construct, have more masters, while in the rest of Europe, the amount of masters are coming down. Yeah, so the way this, they, they take into account that, because uh, Cambridge, Edinburgh, several others, you don't get an undergraduate, you get a master's, so uh, Tom, you have a master's, even though it's the equivalent of a bachelor. So that's why it's, and the thing it's listed as first degree, which is meant to be, even if it says master's, it's assumed to be the first course, an, an undergraduate degree. So we don't see that sort of um, degree inflation uh, because it's usually said, you know, this is, it's defined as being your first degree as opposed to using just a generic term, master's, master's. So it, it does sort of capture that.